The video has downpour spoilers. Hello again, it's been a bit since downpour released and this video is finally out. And oh my god, it took forever. Look at that video length. Cataloging Rainworld's Wildlife is the most viewed video on my channel, and it is easily the one that I dislike watching the most. It's not because the script writing is particularly bad, it's just the mic quality and the editing and the generally low quality of it all that has led to my blood feud with it that I wish to remedy by finally making a good version of the video. This is my second remastered video on this channel. If you couldn't tell by the video length, this will be a remake of both the flora and fauna episodes, updated with new information, better theories, and much better production. I'm going to be going through all the canon creatures seen in Rainworld, as well as all the plants that have a function. You couldn't pay me to document the background bugs or plants. The art that will be shown off in this video was almost entirely made by the artists on my Discord server, in a server event that occurred a casual three months ago. Good lord. Every artist will be credited in the bottom left as their art comes up. Either way, grab a snack and lie back as I serenade you with my high school biology tier wildlife discussion. Starting off with the fauna, and number one, Slugcat. Somewhat intelligent creatures, Slugcats make their home in large tree colonies in the jungles of the Outer Expanse, living in semi-tribal colonies a few tiers of development below the other intelligent fauna found in Rainworld being the scavengers. Not many of you may know, but a Slugcat is not actually an accurate name. If I remember it correctly, it was actually a name made by a fan and was just adopted because people liked it a lot. Slugcats are in fact not slugs, nor cats, but rather some form of rodent, as told to us by like a lot of pieces of dialogue that refers to them as a mouse or a rodent, and none of them refer to them as any form of feline. This fact is also proven by their biology. Mouse-like grasping hands and a fully omnivorous diet are just a few telling aspects that can prove that this thing ain't a fucking cat. A basic slug cat can come in a variety of colors, but mostly in the lighter shades, except for this guy. They seem to showcase a level of intelligence similar to early hominids, showcasing an ability to create murals that display topics as well as communicate stories through that arc, as shown in the Gourmand ending. Their intelligence is also shown through their usage of tools and knowledge of detailed concepts, though that might just be convenience because a human is oftentimes controlling them. Your average slug cat appears to have a slimy skin akin to a frog or a slug, but this skin appears tough enough to withstand dry environments without needing to be constantly rehydrated. Perhaps that's just a quirk of the rain world being humid, but who knows. Either way, their faces have two large eyes and a small black nose, as well as two long ears sprouting from the top. Their tail is thick and doesn't appear to be prehensile in any meaningful way. This is all for your basic slug cat. Though slug cats appear to be a genetic blank slate for which any modification can seemingly be made. Appearing in a number of different roles with a wide margin of unique anatomical details, from the exterior gills and larger eyes of the rivulet, to the thick hair and long tongue of the saint, to whatever the fuck is going on inside a spearmaster's body, they seem to be, pardon the pun, quite good lab rats for any form of genetic modification. This, mixed with their intelligence and maneuverability, makes them ideal for any courier jobs that a being like an iterator might be in need of. Thus why there have been two to four of them used for exactly that purpose. The second creature on our list are the Batflies. A significantly less complicated creature, the Batflies seem to populate all corners of the facility grounds in great numbers. They seem to serve as a base level of the food web for specifically small predators and omnivores. Despite their similarities to bats, they are more likely some sort of moth or butterfly adjacent creature. They are oftentimes found flocking around plants, be that the small white-tipped spiky plants, or that orange herb known as batnip that is listed so much later in the video. They seem to feed off these plants, though that it's also likely that they feed off the background bugs small enough to fit in their mouth, but we don't really know. Judging by their attraction to batnip though, I doubt that. I imagine that they got something to do with that, but we'll get to that. So I'm pretty confident at the moment in their status as primarily herbivorous animals. They live in colonies and seem to flutter about, oftentimes resting in long chains, connecting their legs to the head of another batfly. Their flight patterns seem to vary, with big flaps to gain or lose height, and a rapid buzzing to hover in place. Their lifespan is mostly unknown, but I have a theory about it which brings us to our next entry. The Blue Fruit. Yeah, uh, let me explain. The Blue Fruit is, as stated by Moon, not fruit, but rather a bug pupa the third stage out of four that most insects take during their metamorphosis, right before they reach their adult form. You see where I'm going with this, don't you? 
I believe that blue fruits are batfly pupa. Their size is a little bit suspicious, but some caterpillars and grubs are a whole lot larger than their adult forms anyways. It could be that the grubs live in those colonies of white-tipped plants or even burrowed deep underground feeding on plant roots or something before they climb to the ceiling and hang down on that long strand of fibrous tissue that holds most blue fruit aloft before pupating. While it is likely that the blue fruit is just the pupa of an entirely different bug that we will never see, I find that boring and also kind of a cop-out, and this theory is cooler. Next up, jellyfish. The jellyfish are aquatic predators, bearing many visual similarities to the jellyfish of our world, specifically the Portuguese man o' war, which it shares its hunting tactics with. The jellyfish is often spotted floating atop bodies of salt water, letting their tentacles hang downwards to ensnare any small prey, likely prey so small that the slug cat can't even interact with them, such as the background bugs. Once their prey is ensnared, they will deliver an electric shock to them, which will stun them. Uh, it's powerful enough to even stun creatures as large as a vulture, and can be used as a weapon due to this trait. But spoilers, uh, jellyfish in real life don't use electricity, they use venom. This is specifically not a venom, it creates light and sound that suggests its voltaic nature. This lack of venom also seems to contribute to the fact that Slugcat can eat it whole without fear of poisoning itself. This brings in the theory of the jellyfish, considering that they are only found in shoreline, specifically in massive quantities within Moon. Could it be that jellyfish evolved from some sort of purposed organisms designed around iterators? Some sort of battery or power source that fell off the side of Moon and into the ocean and was forced to fend for itself? It's likely not, but it's a decent theory either way. Next up, vulture grubs. Vulture grubs have always been a bit weird. They are fat yellow worms that seem to spend most of their time underground or in small enclosed spaces. Their head appears mostly if not fully mechanical, appearing to house a device that allows it to shoot a long laser. When threatened, the vulture grub will shoot this laser into the sky, seemingly in an attempt to summon its namesake, a vulture. It is unknown why they do this, because if there's nothing else around, the vulture will eat the grub. The king vultures leave no questions to the lethality of it too. The vulture is not a friend of the vulture grubs. Could it be that vulture grubs are simply a type of larva or grub to another creature that uses the threat of a vulture attack as a defense mechanism against other creatures? Nothing is ever seen to eat them besides slug cats. Lizards even refuse to eat them for taming. My guess is that they were previously a creature used by the ancients for lighting, but once they were left alone, they evolved to use their lights to signal predators. A risky, but evidently somewhat successful adaptation. Next up, the squid cotta. Small flying animals, these squid cottas are quite hard to pin down in terms of anatomy and phylogenetic history. This is primarily because we don't actually know if they're squids. Like, more or less every resource that I could find tells us that they're squids, but they have a lot of features that aren't really conducive to being a squid, such as their insect wings, the weird plate that they have in the center of their head, their fully terrestrial lifestyle, their presumably hard and shiny skin that doesn't seem like cephalopod skin in the slightest. So, my theory is that they aren't squids. They're closer to the second half of their name, a cicada. Their weird body plans and unusual flying style could just be a weird evolutionary quirk, this art made me realize that the perspective in Rain World might just be a little bit flawed, but again, I could just be wrong. They might just be insects that are shaped like squids. So let's talk about the things that we do know more about. Squid cotta are relatively neutral, but still intelligent flying carnivores that feast primarily on batflies and leeches, which they grab with their tentacles from the air or water. They can be spotted in areas with lots of open air and can usually be found in groups of two or more. There are two variants of the squid cotta that we see in Rain World, white and black. Black squid cottas are more common, being seen hunting for food and bringing it back to their nest, whereas white squid cottas are seen more around the nests and are generally larger. This could be sexual dimorphism, where the females, usually larger and arthropod species, stay and watch over potential offspring while the males gather food around the area. This could also mean that squid cottas are dedicated parents, an unlikely trait among insects but a common trait among cephalopods like octopi. God, this is so confusing. Anyway, moving on. Snails! Rather large and relatively confusing mollusks, the snails in Rain World are a little different from the snails in our world. First off, they might not be snails. They likely are, but they're also sometimes called turtles, and they have legs. The main feature of their body is the shell, a large, usually brightly colored almond-shaped thing that allows them to perform their signature move. 
their pop. These creatures are capable of emitting a shockwave that flings and stuns creatures that threaten them, traveling further underwater, as shockwaves usually tend to do. This shockwave is likely a defense mechanism that they develop to fuck with their predators. It could be that the way that they do it is similar to a gunshot or a compressed air mechanism. By drawing air into the shell, compressing it, and then letting it out all at once, the resulting shockwave would create a very loud bang and likely send lots of shit flying. The counter-argument to this theory is that, while underwater, the pop produces no bubbles, and it can produce the pop while underwater, even if it spawned there. So it could be that it's a sort of muscle inside the shell that slams against the side to produce the sound. But we honestly don't really have an idea. Snails are found crawling amidst the damper areas, such as shoreline and drainage system, likely doing so because they need the water for moisture or because it helps their shockwave attack to be more effective. They probably just eat algae and small plants. Next up, the lantern mice. What we can confidently presume are rodents, the lantern mice can be seen roaming around the Shaded Citadel and a few other dark areas of Rainworld. Their main claim to fame is their lanternness, that being the fact that they glow in the dark. This glowing helps ward off predators who fear the light, such as the spiders in Shaded Citadel, but it seems as though many of them are learning the distinction between lantern mice and the actual sun, because it doesn't really take long for a few of the smaller ones to wisen up and just kind of kill it. Whenever a lantern mouse sleeps, it seems to crawl up the ceiling and dangle down on a long rope of some kind, potentially a long tail or some other form of butt rope. Either way, they then enter into a non-illuminated form for some reason before glowing again, but much brighter. This is how they sleep, presumably to be safe from spiders, as they hang, which wouldn't be able to reach them and wouldn't want to come near them as the intensified glow would probably keep them away. They seem to be scared of literally everything, likely because they're prey animal number one for everything that they aren't designed to loosely avoid. As for their diet, we don't see them actively eating or hunting for anything in the game, though they do have a hidden bit of code that tells them to eat batflies, which is presumably non-functional because I, I haven't seen it. My final guess is that they're omnivorous, like real mice, eating fruits, plants, and whatever small bugs they can catch, as well as just kind of anything that they can find that gives nutritional value. Next up, the egg bugs and drop wigs. Now, it may seem weird to include both of these reject roaches into the same entry, but hear me out. I have a theory. A game theory, perhaps. I believe that egg bugs and drop wigs are a form of sexual dimorphism. I don't know which is which. It could be either. I don't really know which one's the male, which one's the female, but nothing else really explains why the egg bugs are only ever seen with eggs. We rarely ever see them otherwise. So, to start things off, drop wigs. Dropwigs are large insects, seemingly in a similar family to whip scorpions such as vinegaroons, which aren't insects, they're, they're arachnids, but you know. If you look at the body structure, it's pretty similar. It's kind of hard to get a good screenshot, but I believe that dropwigs have pedipalps, modified legs used for grasping. They use these pedipalps in their main hunting method, where they will hang upside down from a surface and then drop down onto a poor unsuspecting prey animal before killing it and bringing it back to its den. The neat thing about drop wigs that makes me think that they're whip scorpions even more is that they don't have a venomous bite like those spiders do. They rarely one-shot if they do bite you. Egg bugs, on the other hand, have completely different body structures, with a notable absence of the pedipalps and a notable presence of a payload. All egg bugs have a load of several eggs on their back at all times. They carry these eggs until they presumably hatch, and then we don't know what happens. So where does my theory come in? Well, it could be that dropwigs are designed to find mates, likely females, but it could be that the females of the dropwigs, because they're bigger and insects usually do that. We mentioned this in the Squid Kata entry. Another notable thing about dropwigs is that they have forceps, something mostly seen on earwigs. Forceps on earwigs are presumed to be used to assist in mating, alongside fending off bigger predators and even catching prey. Egg bugs don't have these. Or the pedipalps, it seems. This could mean that egg bugs, once they reach a certain stage in their life cycle, lose these features, and thus the ability to find food on their own. This could mean that the egg bug devotes all its time into protecting its eggs, losing sleep and food for the sake of its offspring and dying once they hatch. Many insects' final forms often have no mouth parts at all. Good examples are silk moths. So it could be that this is similar. 
Though this does conflict with my whip scorpion theory, because most arachnids don't go through metamorphosis. They start as smaller versions of the adults, rather than getting wings or some shit later in their life. This entire theory is a little iffy, but like, you know, it's cool, so whatever. I, I, I can't really explain the egg bugs otherwise. Next up, the yeeks. The strangely named yeeks are small creatures that bear a resemblance to frogs. Yeeks spend most of their time in rooms around the edge of the retaining wall, and are native to the outer expanse. They jump around on two club-like appendages that seem to act as springing limbs, similar to what frogs and grasshoppers have. These aren't their walking limbs, but instead appear to be a sort of tail-like limb that drags behind them when they do walk. Despite their rather notable resemblance to frogs, I don't believe that they are amphibians. First off, yeeks are never shown to rely on any bodies of water. Second off, they have spines on their backs that don't appear to be fleshy, but rather hard as they don't flop or jiggle, suggesting scales of some kind. They also only eat flora like gooey ducks and slime mold, which very, very few frogs do from what I know. All this leads me to believe that they're more reptilian than amphibious, and likely a form of lizard. Though their odd biology does make this hard to pin down, we also don't really see them do any behavior besides standing in place and jumping. Next up, hazers. Hazers are kind of weird because they're fully aquatic creatures that don't pose a direct threat to the slow cat in some way. Makes them feel kind of out of place in that regard. Hazers are small cephalopods found around or inside of bodies of water. Their primary biological feature is their ink, which they can spray out upon being threatened. This ink comes out in a cloud that lingers even in the air. This ink obscures the vision of most predators, but does cause the hazer to literally die upon use, which puts us in quite the predicament. Why would a creature evolve an ink sac that kills them when expelled? Well, perhaps it's because hazers used to be nothing more than pigment creators during their purposed organism days. They would be raised for their ink, and then slaughtered or squeezed to dry when they were deemed ripe. This meant that quantity of ink was all that their creators cared about when modifying them. They evolved swimming skills, but kept this disproportionate amount of ink, leading to this fatal flaw. Though we do have to keep in mind, there's always the possibility that the ink is toxic to their predators, excusing why they were able to survive. The predators that ate one got splooged so hard that they either died or got incredibly sick, leading to a genetic memory that eating hazers is no good. Another interesting and very confusing thing about the hazers is that most are often found completely beached. In my last video, I posited that this was a mating ritual, but I have a bit of a better theory now. The rain. It could be that when everything floods, hazers emerge from their shallow pools to explore the flooded tunnels of regions, meeting up with other hazers and mating, finding food, etc. This could lead to many of them getting stranded in places near to bodies of water, with no hope of returning unassisted. Very stupid squids at the end of the day. Funny guys. Next up, jetfish. The jetfish confuse me. They have traits of like 12 different animals with no real match. Jetfish can be found in large bodies of water, where they swim around looking for food. They appear to be omnivorous, eating whatever they can find, from bugs on the water's surface to the glowweed near the bottom of a submerged superstructure. Now let's get to their body plan. They have two curved forelimbs used for something, and two long tendrils that they use as seemingly rotors for their primary movement tool, a large jet at the end of their body that launches out a high pressure stream of water to launch them forwards. Jetfish don't really make sense. At first I thought that they could be a form of cephalopod, another creature that can often be seen using a siphon or a jet of water to move through the oceans of our world, but the body plants don't really match up at all. So my guess is that there's some sort of strange fish. Really wish I had a more concrete thing here, but they mark a pathway where things stop being applicable to real world biology. So without further ado, let's get funky. The grapple worm. Oh, hell yeah, that's the strange shit I'm talking about. The grapple worm makes even less sense than the jetfish. They are tube-like worms with a long tongue that comes out of both sides of them that allows them to stick to walls and ceilings to traverse like this. Generally, grapple worms are just kind of odd. They're the most tool creature in Rain World by a pretty long margin. They just kind of do the one thing. My last theory on them was quite the long shot, but I'm tempted to stand by it but I doubt its validity as more than just a fun thought. Reeling it in, though, my new theory is that grapple worms just kind of do that. 
They just grapple around. It could be that their tongues are sticky all over and designed to catch insects that fly into them or something. I don't know, man. This creature is so weird. Like, maybe they just eat algae. Maybe they're chemotrophs eating primarily the smog and the shit that comes out of five pebbles. That's why they're found all over Underhang and Chimney, but even that doesn't make sense because they're also found in Metropolis, which is pretty fucking dead and likely isn't pumping out the chemicals needed to sustain an organism of this size. I'm throwing in the towel on this one. I deadass don't know. If you have any theories on what the fuck these guys eat, I would love to hear them because, again, I'm just, like, out. Next up, the Garbage Worm. Probably the second weirdest of these early entries, the Garbage Worms spend most of their time in the garbage wastes. And though they can also be found in more or less anywhere that piles of garbage can be found, such as Chimney Canopy. Their daily schedule seems to involve sitting in place, wiggling a bit, and sorting garbage all day. If any unruly bits of trash walk by, such as an errant spear of some sort, they will take it and put it into the designated spot where spears go, which is underground. When they're not annoying you slightly, they appear to stick their heads into the ground and sift around for any errant bits of stray matter, either to sort or to eat. If a slug cat chooses to spear a garbage worm, every garbage worm in the region will enter into attack mode for the cycle. All of their eyes will turn a bright red, and they will only have violence on the mind. If any slug cat walks past the garbage worm in this state, they will be grabbed and either flung around a bit or held underwater by the garbage worm in an attempted at drowning. The garbage worms are the subject of a good few theories as to their origin and purpose. Previously, I stated that they were fully inorganic refuse reclamation automatons due to this white pearl. And I somewhat believe that theory still, but I've changed my tune a little bit. The original evidence for the garbage worms are fully mechanical theory was the pearl and the fact that they never flee from the rain despite having the easy ability to, suggesting that they're durable enough to withstand the heavy pressure for extended periods of time. Generally, there's no answer given to us by Downpour, but I'm inclined to believe that they're at least more mechanical than otherwise, given their generally simple design, with no outstanding major biological features, and all the generally weird stuff about them. But at the end of the day, they're at least partially organic, because, like, I mean, they're, they're a rain world creature. I, literally, even the shelters are partially organic. Next up, the leeches. Leeches are aquatic predators, very similar to the creatures of the same name found in our world. They have long, tube-like bodies with a single mouth and no distinguishable eyes. They spend most of their time in bodies of water, with seemingly no regard for how large, small, or deep they end up being. And if a creature comes by, they will latch on and presumably begin to suck their blood. In-game, this merely comes off as them weighing you down. If too many latch on, this can lead to a quick death by drowning, as your slug cat is no longer able to keep themselves afloat. On the bright side though, most leeches dry out on land, so simply reaching shore and waiting is enough to get them off of you. There are three types of leeches that can be found in Rainworld, the regular red leech found in mostly freshwater habitats, the sea leech, a larger, heavier blue variant found in saltwater habitats and specifically in the vast ocean near shoreline, and the jungle leech, semi-amphibious green variants with much more perseverance, able to latch on for a much longer time without drying out. Jungle leeches are also the only type of leech to drain food pips from you, likely a method of showing the blood loss affecting Slugcat after such a long period of having a leech on them. Next up, the noodle flies. Flying aerial predators, the noodle flies are an odd creature with not all that many analogs to real world creatures. Their bodies are long and floppy, as their name would suggest, held aloft by a series of insect wings that buzz constantly. Within their mouth sits a long, needle-like proboscis that can quickly harden and be used as a sharp blade to impale any creatures that catch the noodle fly's ire. Fiercely parental, noodle flies can often be found with a group of babies huddled around them, so let's talk about their life cycle, shall we? Noodle flies start off as a pulsing red egg which hangs from the ceiling in a very similar way to the blue fruit. Each egg contains two baby noodle flies and will hatch if kept within a safe place for long enough, such as a shelter. Baby noodle flies enter the world harmless and nutritious, so they're in a pretty rough spot, or at least that would be the case if it weren't for their parents. Noodle fly babies follow their parents around everywhere, even attaching onto their backs to be carried around. Adult noodle flies spend most of their time protecting and rearing the next generation. If anything gets in the way of that goal through harming or killing one of their infants, they are getting the proboscis. Adult noodle flies, when angered, are fast and relentless, following their target seemingly non-stop. 
As for food and reproduction, though, how does that happen? Well, it's somewhat likely that adult noodleflies forsake hunting altogether in favor of protecting their young, in a similar way to how octopus mothers do it, as they can never be seen actively attacking something unprovoked. However, it is at least somewhat likely that they eat the same things that they end up killing, and their young feed from their mother in a similar way to how mammals do. It could be that these spots that the young noodleflies latch onto are some odd form of insectoid milk patch that dispenses nutrients to the young. As for reproduction, we honestly have no idea. If we go with this theory, it could be that all the large noodleflies we see are females, which leads into the question of where the males are. Well, it could be that the males are either hidden, simply don't exist, or are so small that they're very similar to like how anglerfish do it, where the male is just kind of like a tumor on the side of the female after a while. It could be that the noodleflies that we see are hermaphroditus as well, or even capable of asexual reproduction, though that is mostly a conclusion brought about by the lack of information that we have on where the rest of them are. Next up, the lizards. Easily the group containing the most variety, the lizards are a group of medium to large terrestrial carnivores that can be found in every corner of the map. They come in a variety of shapes and colors that can define their size, behavior, evolutionary features, and their spot on the food chain. The main things that define all lizards are their heavily armored heads that can deflect spears, powerful bite force designed to prevent their prey from escaping, and a diet of small animals. First up, the green lizards. The fattest and slowest of the group, the green lizards are a strange outlier from the rest. They have an incredibly thick hide and a strong bite compared to the other lizards, but they lack the ability to climb poles, making them a comparably negligible threat. They also sport a wide berth of strange interactions, such as complete immunity to worm grass, centipede shocks, and red lizard bites. They are also seemingly completely ignored by the main predator of most lizards, being vultures. Additionally, to add on to the weirdness quota, they will oftentimes hunt other lizards, able to successfully fend off basically any other lizard due to their strong mixture of health and bite strength. G Green lizards are very weird, and very strange choice for the first one on the list, but hey, they're considered the tutorial lizards, I guess, so, you know, they're talked about first. Next up, pink lizards. Pink lizards are by all means the actual standard. They have moderate health, speed, and bite damage, with no real unique features to set them apart from the other lizards. More or less, everything that a pink lizard can do, every other lizard species can also do, usually better. They can climb poles, hunt small creatures, and fight amongst each other. What else to talk about? It's... According to the wiki, they have the wildest hue variation, which is probably the reason why they're called pink, purple, or magenta lizards, depending on who you ask. Neat. Next up, the blue lizards. One of the smallest and generally weakest lizards, the blue lizard adds two major things to the framework provided by the pink lizards. The first addition being their improved climbing ability, seemingly similar to the way that geckos climb. Blue lizards can easily climb on completely vertical surfaces without any real difficulty or lowered mobility at all. The second addition is their tongue, a long sticky tongue that can be propelled out of their mouth to grapple prey that would otherwise be out of reach. These two factors make the blue lizard quite good at taking out unprepared prey, but they are generally weaker and smaller than every other type of lizard, meaning that seemingly easy prey can turn the tables on them relatively quickly without too much difficulty. They're sometimes even properly hunted by other stronger lizards. Next up, the white lizards. The resident ambush predator of the group, the white lizards are very similar in bulk and speed to the pink lizards, though they possess the same climbing abilities and tongue as the blue lizards. Their main forte, however, is their color-changing abilities. White lizards are able to change the colors and patterns of their skin in a very similar way to how cuttlefish do in order to blend in with the surface they're resting on. This makes them remarkably successful ambush predators, sometimes. They strike at inopportune moments when their prey isn't expecting to run into a predator. However, if a white lizard is spotted and harmed, their chromatophores will freak out and display a varied mess of colors. This is confusing because this tracks more similarly with computer glitches than anything a chameleon or cuttlefish would do, so my guess is that this is some sort of defense mechanism designed to confuse and disorient potential predators so that they might give the white lizard a crucial moment to escape. It doesn't seem to work all too often, though. Next up, the orange lizard, arguably the most interesting of the lizards in terms of unique adaptations. The orange lizards are almost completely identical to pink lizards in terms of stats, but they have a crucial, unique feature that makes them much more threatening, their pack hunting. Orange lizards form packs of anywhere from 2 to 5, with 1 to 4 regular lizards and 1 alpha. 
They communicate seemingly through the tendrils on the backs of their heads, and the Alpha can be differentiated from the rest of the group through their much larger tendrils. They seem to communicate almost telepathically, with little actual communication delay, but when the Alpha is killed or tamed, every lizard in the pack will lose this communication ability. This suggests that the Alpha is acting as some sort of communication hub. This specific type of pack hunting behavior, where it is all facilitated by one individual, is seen basically nowhere in the animal kingdom that I know of, but might be somewhere along the lines of radio frequencies rather than something like pheromones. Radio frequencies do work like this. A cell tower is needed to receive and disseminate signals across a wider area. When that cell tower goes down, most individuals lose connection to that network. It could be that these lizards are using a primitive biological form of radio communication, or something along those lines, to communicate simple signals such as where prey is and where they are, using the signal receiving ability of their alpha to facilitate all of this. It's a bit of an out there theory, but I think it makes sense, especially considering how wacky some of the other creatures that we're going to get to are. Next up, a comparably much simpler lizard, the black lizards. Black lizards are also quite unusual, but for much simpler reasons. These lizards are completely blind, relying on vibration sensing hairs on their faces to detect prey. They live in dark places, usually deep underground, and hunt prey with their comparably better senses in that environment. This type of adaptation is found most often in troglobites, or creatures that live exclusively in caves. Evolving away from eyes and towards improved senses of smell or hearing, it's a classic thing seen in animals such as moles, ulms, and other species of blind predatory animals. Black lizards are slower than the regular framework provided by the pink lizard, but they're notably stronger, having a much more lethal bite. They seem to hunt in packs within these tight, dark spaces, cornering their prey where they are least capable of escaping. Next up, the salamander. Amphibious variants of the regular lizards, the salamanders can be found in most areas that contain significant amounts of water. Their main adaptation is rather obvious, being their exterior gills, obviously inspired by those of an axolotl. These gills allow them to avoid drowning and stick underwater for quite a while. Their aquatic aptitude doesn't end there though, as they're also significantly faster swimmers than any other lizard, capable of diving and maneuvering at great speeds. This, mixed with a significantly better vision range while underwater, makes any body of water containing a salamander much more threatening than it would be with any other lizard type. Besides this though, the salamander contains very little distinguishing features from the pink lizard, besides their tongue, which is similar to what the blue lizards have, but it's solidly middle of the pack. Next up, the caramel lizards. Caramel lizards are the first lizard we're discussing that comes from downpour, and they sure are something. Deviating from the framework of the pink lizard, caramel lizards are much more similar to green lizards, being heavy, incapable of climbing poles, and having a much stronger bite. Caramel lizards also have a good bit more tricks though, as they possess not only an extra pair of legs, but also the ability to spit sticky globs of fluid at their prey to slow them down. This extra pair of legs seems to allow them to pounce at their prey, shoving their entire body forwards at an impressive speed to grab prey their slower green cousins wouldn't dream of being able to catch. These new traits allowed the caramel lizard to completely outcompete the green lizards in the same timeline, leading to the complete extinction of the latter. Next up, the strawberry lizards. Incredibly unique creatures, the strawberry lizards are found only at the very end of the timeline. Strawberry lizards are quite scrawny, with a skinny body masking its size with significantly more frills than other lizards would have. The general lack of muscle mass on this body does make the strawberry lizard relatively clumsy, but it makes up for this with the longest and strongest tongue of all lizards. Though this lizard doesn't use its tongue to pull in weaker creatures, but rather as a method to pull itself towards those weaker creatures. This grappling hook style of hunting allows the strawberry lizard to close gaps that no other lizard would be able to with such precision. Though this is often facilitated by their relatively light weight, which allows their lizard brethren to hunt them more reliably, meaning strawberry lizards are oftentimes hunted and consumed by even blue lizards. Next up, the eel lizard. Another water-based lizard, the eel lizards are the first fully aquatic lizard, beating out even salamanders in their propensity towards water. They are significantly faster underwater than salamanders, capable of escaping even the fastest underwater predators and catching up with some of the fastest underwater prey. Though this increased agility underwater comes at the cost of their agility on land, meaning they will rarely ever follow their prey out of the water. Honestly, the eel lizards are probably the most simple of the lizards introduced in Downpour. They're just kind of salamanders, but faster. 
Next up, the Cyan Lizard, a much stranger lizard from the others on this list. The Cyan Lizards are one of the base game's harder challenges. These creatures take the framework of the mobile blue lizard, but grant it more health, bite lethality, and mobility. That mobility comes in the form of a series of vents on their back that allow it to launch out pressurized gas to fire themselves in a direction of their choice. This burst of speed allows them to catch up with their prey much quicker than one would expect, sometimes even pouncing directly on top of them. Cyan lizards are strange in terms of their design. They have features that few other lizards would have, such as glowing eyes and a roar that sounds like a Skrillex backing track having an aneurysm. This suggests that they are fully artificial, or at the very least much, much, much more modified than other lizards, possessing adaptations given to them by a higher power, probably an iterator, in order to make them even deadlier. The obvious answer to this is pebbles, but we ultimately don't really have an answer, so yeah, it's, it's probably pebbles. Next up, the red lizard. The final lizard on our list is a monstrous apex predator with more hate coursing through its veins than blood. Red lizards are massive, with their head, forelimbs, and spines all glowing a bright, saturated red. They possess basically every single trait of most base game lizards, but turned up to 11, a powerful bite that instantly kills any small creature it hits, incredible speed and resistance to stuns, the propensity to prey on other lizards, and the caramel lizard's spit globs, which it uses to slow down its prey so that it can get within range. Red lizards are also the most fearless of all lizards, fighting against anything they can see, seemingly no matter the danger to themselves. This increased level of aggression is likely why they're so uncommon, as they likely claim wide swaths of territory and fight other individuals to the death merely for entering. Except the two of them that are in outskirts, which I guess are just like married or something. Anyways, moving on from the giant fucking section that is the lizards, directly into the notably smaller but also pretty fucking giant section that is the centipedes. Centipedes are arthropods found all around the world with a few distinguishable features, including but not limited to their segmented bodies that can grow to incredible sizes, their two-headed linear body plan, as well as their ability to deliver devastating shocks to creatures that get too close. This shock attack is achieved through connecting both ends of their body with their prey. This is likely due to their internal anatomy forming a sort of incomplete circuit made of a long conductive organ and an electricity storing organ that is finally completed when the two ends are connected to a creature. Once the circuit is complete, a deadly amount of electricity flows through the centipede's body into the creature, frying it thoroughly if it's smaller than the centipede. They likely use this shock to kill their prey before consuming them, Additionally, centipedes can see from both heads, and their vision is highly movement-related, meaning that you can somewhat avoid their ire by staying still. Now that we have the easy stuff lined out, let's talk about the unique stuff, the variants. Starting with the orange centipedes. The orange centipedes are what I'm grouping all the basic centipedes into. Normally, they're considered different creatures due to their size, but they're all the same species. They start off as infants, which hunt down small animals such as batflies, though their shock is still enough to stun creatures that would otherwise seek to hunt them, like Slugcat. As they grow larger, they reach the adult and then overgrown sizes, each one gaining progressively more speed, durability, and aggression as they get larger. These centipedes appear to spend most of their time in the dark, forming nests of several individuals in small enclosed spaces, where they rear up the next generation. This communal style of living is only seen with these types of centipedes. Next up, the red centipedes. A deceptively similar variant to the orange centipedes, the red centipedes share the coloration of the red lizards, as well as their drive to kill anything that moves. Red centipedes are very large, being bigger than overgrown orange centipedes, and as such, they are not only faster, bulkier, and angrier, but they also have a unique adaptation, being armor. Each segment of the red centipede's exoskeleton has sloped armor that can deflect spears, giving the red centipede many more chances to fuck your shit up. As for the origin of the red centipede, I have two theories. One, an anidorator made them as a funny trick, and two, they're just more overgrown orange centipedes. We never get to see young red centipedes, and they share most of their body plan besides the armor and coloration with the orange centipedes. So it could be possible that red centipedes are just the oldest specimens of orange centipedes that have grown to such an extent that their exoskeletons have hardened into armor, bringing about a red tint. It's possible, but they also don't live communally with other centipedes anymore, so it's still just a theory and very far from one that's canon. Next up, the centiwings. Are, as we list these, they only get scarier, huh? 
Centa wings are green flying variants of the orange centipedes. They have an array of reddish wings covering their sides, which allow them to fly by undulating their body like how an eel or a snake would swim. They live primarily in bright open air spaces where they can fly away from any predators and get a good look at any potential prey. Centa wings in general are inconsistent in their aggression. Sometimes a centa wing will decide that you can just walk by, other times they're pursuing you through state lines and taking your family hostage just for the fun of it. I can't really think of a biological reason why they're like this, I just think it's kind of funny. These creatures were mostly untouched in Downpour, except for the addition of baby centa wings, which are just reskinned baby orange centipedes, which suggests that they get their wings through a molt at some point later in life. The final centipede is the Aquapede, probably my choice for the scariest fucking thing in this video game. The Aquapedes are large aquatic variants of the regular centipedes. Rather than legs, they have an array of paddle-like limbs that allow them to swim at worrying speeds towards anything in the water that they deem as lunch. Despite having a lot of theoretical similarities with centiwings, they have a lot of other different things as well. Besides their chosen medium to kill shit, their biggest difference is their size. Aquapedes are big as hell, about the size of an overgrown centipede, and they use this weight to their advantage. If you are grabbed by an aquapede, you are gonna sink. This makes them even deadlier than most other centipede variants due to the sheer advantage that they have over most of their prey. Even if you do manage to get it off you, you're probably gonna die from drowning either way. Next up, the spiders. Oh shit, you smell that? It's another list of scary things. Fast and deadly predators. The spiders are found in most underground or otherwise dark areas, hunting with venomous fangs or darts or whatever their specific gameplay niche asks of them. One could make a case that each of these spider variants are different species, and while that could be true, a recent addition brings that into question, and I feel like highlighting it. Spiders mostly seem to hunt small animals, and all seem to have a weakness to light, with a bright and sudden light even being lethal to some smaller variants. Anyways, let's get onto the variants of this potentially linked group of spooky arachnids. Starting off with the small spiders. What we can presume to be the youngest of the spiders, the small spiders are swarm predators that live in the darkest parts of Rainworld. Their aversion to light leads them to primarily hunt in near pitch black, as well as develop their primary defense mechanism and hunting strategy. These spiders, when threatened, will connect butt to mouth to form a coalescopede, a horrifying chain of skittering legs that books it towards anything that looks relatively tasty. At some point, they even overcome their fear of light and just collapse onto their prey like a mountain. When they do reach their prey, they cover every inch of it like that one fucking scene from One Punch Man, biting their prey and doing what spiders do when they get a hold of their prey. Despite this innate danger, it is usually rather easy to avoid a coalescopede, as they can be dispersed with a spear or any explosives, as well as being relatively easy to outrun. Doesn't mean you're getting away from the psychological damage, though. That's gonna last for a while. Next up, the big spiders. The aptly named big spiders are what I can presume to be an older variant of the small spiders, but we'll get to that later. The big spiders are lightweight predators that move swiftly through dark areas looking for prey that they can catch. They have two methods of attack, a non-lethal grab and their giant fuck-off fangs with potent enough venom to kill even with a graze. However, this species is also very frail, suffering from the same light sensitivity as the others, sometimes even avoiding prey entirely if caught in broad daylight. They also seem to be quite reckless. Big spiders seem to think that their speed will allow them to get out of anything, making for some rather entertaining moments where a big spider will just kind of run into obvious death or slip into a pit because of how fast it was hustling. Okay, what else do we have to talk about? Oh yeah, right, uh, their ability to bring each other back from the dead. You know, the normal stuff that spiders can do. Resurrection. If a big spider has recently died, one of its kin can run over to it and do something, that brings it back for a few seconds to hopefully find a den to rest in so it can come back to life. They can do this as many times as they want so long as the corpse isn't too dead as deemed by this list of reasons. I'll also elaborate more on this particular oddity later, but my guess is that they have a sort of special pedipalp near their fangs that injects a special mixture of chemicals and some such that brings the spider back for a brief stint, hopefully so it can find some safety and recover. Next up, the spitter spiders. What was previously the largest of the spiders, the spitter spiders are large, bulkier versions of the big spiders, sporting larger bodies, slower movement speed, and a red coloration. These creatures seem to be a lot more cautious than the downright suicidal big spiders, oftentimes sitting back and waiting for the perfect moment to utilize their special adaptations. 
As per their name, the spitter spiders have something to spit. When they spot a target within range, they will shoot a number of darts out of their face, which have a venom sac attached to them that releases a paralytic toxin into the bloodstream of the target, knocking them out after a few seconds. When that target is successfully incapacitated, the spitter spider will waddle on over and grab them, taking them back to its den for lunch. An interesting thing about the spitter spider is that they don't have a traditional bite attack with their fangs like the big spiders. They rather just grab shit and eventually the shit they grab is incapacitated. This leads me to believe that the spitter spider fangs have turned into the darts that they shoot, and thus they have lost that close range instant kill option. In terms of behavior, the spitter spiders suffer the same weaknesses as the big spider, frailty and an aversion to light, though they are immune to specifically the flashbang. And they also uh, don't have the same risk that comes with the necessary close range engagement. Finally, the mother spiders. A much simpler variant of the big spider, the mother spider has one gimmick. The mother spider is fat and slow and has basically no HP, but when it dies it releases a swarm of small spiders that quickly form one to two coalescopedes and start fucking shit up in the name of their mother. Like most single mothers, the mother spider is not against killing bitches when it's required, though their main threat is still their death payload. Speaking of that death payload, it's very similar to how bigger spiders like wolf spiders function in real life, carrying young spiderlings around until they reach an age where they can safely function on their own. There's tons of videos of people killing spiders and then having to deal with like 200 spiderlings immediately afterwards. So, onwards from that, how do the spiders work in terms of lifespan and speciation? Well, I have an idea as to that, but it's a theory, so forgive me if it's a bit off the hook. I have a theory that at some point, spiders were a hive-based organism, or at least had some form of communal living. Their young can molt and age into any number of different casts, similar to the real-life marauder ants, which have adults that can vary in size by orders of magnitude based off their role in the colony. They can either carry brood, hunt recklessly, or hunt tactfully. They currently seem to have at least a small form of communal living, as there would be no other reason for the big spiders to have that revival pedipalp if they were deeming their kin as competition. There's also the very strange and downright theory confirming fact that big spiders can also revive spitter spiders, which I held back until now, uh, not because I'm learning this after writing the spider section, but for video structuring. Yep. Now, it could entirely be that spitter spiders are just older big spiders, but that wouldn't explain the difference in their hunting methods, as they would have to go undergo a second metamorphosis and a number of molts to even get close to that level of differentiation. It's a strange theory, but, you know, it could work. Next on the list, the scavengers. The ape-like scavengers can be found in most corners of the world, from its lowest depths to its highest peaks. They are the closest thing to a human-like race that still remains in the world, though the slugcats are intelligent, they lack the societal structure displayed by the scavengers. But let's talk about their biology before we get into their anthropology. Scavengers are structurally similar to apes in our world, specifically chimpanzees, at least in the proportion department. Their arms are long, especially compared to their legs, suggesting a previous arboreal existence for which such climbing limbs would be necessary. Their heads appear to be somewhat armored, though nowhere near as powerfully as the lizards. From this hardened skull grows two antlers, which can vary greatly between individuals. Overall, scavengers just have great genetic diversity. An individual can vary in eye shape, antler shape, antler size, and even the color of their fur and head. These same physical traits can also be used to deduce their behaviors, but I'll not get into that in this already very long video. Here's a video essay on it by Brand Flakes that explains it in much better detail. It should still be up to date unless they fundamentally change the scavenger AI in Downpour. We don't know what scavengers eat, but it can be presumed that they are at least somewhat carnivorous, as they evidently hunt the reindeer. Reindeer skulls can be seen at every scavenger toll. It can also be presumed that they hunt the yeeks, as they have a kill-on-sight relationship with them, and there's no real other reason to explain that. Speaking of scavengers killing, a scavenger can be spotted most commonly in a group of three to six, either a hunting party or a kill squad, found roaming the lands. They will have an array of equipment, from spears to explosives to lanterns adorning them as they search the area for pearls, food, or slug cats that the tribe hates enough. Scavenger tribes can often crop up anywhere, but are most often found in places with a lot of pearls, discarded messaging tools used by the ancients that once ruled over this land. These pearls are now used as a sort of currency, similar to how we see gold. They allow us to trade for materials with the scavengers, and are placed on display strings in particularly wealthy tribes. 
Scavenger tribes can come in a variety of types, from the nomadic tribes to the more sessile ones. The latter ones will usually have a chieftain of some kind. The most notable one lies within Artificer's Campaign, as the largest scavenger society we see existed atop five pebbles within his city before Artificer fucking murked it. This society has also bred some unique individuals, capable of jumping far distances and withstanding much more punishment than their brethren. They adorn these aptly named elites with uniquely carved vulture masks and often give them electrified spears crafted with the usage of coils and charged with centipedes. However, this is nothing compared to their king, a unique individual that rose to the top of the scavenger quartocracy through pure strength and wit, adorning himself in red centipede armor and a very ornate mask, as well as interestingly having a citizen ID drone. Killing him proves the fact that the scavengers thrive off of a quartocracy, a society where the strongest rule, as the one that kills the king, becomes the king. Next up, the firebug. Uh, they're weird. Really weird. Like, we don't even know if they really exist weird. So, uh, the, the, the firebug is kinda like an egg bug, except they're in Rubicon, which if you didn't know is the area at the end of the Saint campaign, I told you there'd be spoilers. This area has the depths and the void merge into what I can only presume to be a mishmash of the entire world above. Yeah, they only show up in that area, so it's highly likely that they're entirely supernatural, and I'm probably gonna run with that, but also, they have some other neat things about them. So firebugs are known for their payload, which in this case is a few fire eggs and a few fire spears. Fire eggs are food and also Sticky bombs? That, that that can't be good for you. Fire spears, on the other hand, are seemingly magically infused super spears that do a lot more damage. The first hit on a firebug will always cause it to shed its eggs and, with the fury of the depths below, turn into the scariest fucking thing in the game. Firebugs, upon taking damage, will turn into vengeful kill everything machines. They will charge towards any small animal, or even a large animal, grab a hold of them, and then stab them numerous times with the spears that poke through their body until that thing is dead. I'm honestly just going to take this opportunity to not have to figure out why they do this because, man, I really don't know. Firebugs are weird. Cool, but weird. Uh, let's just say that they're void born imitations of the egg bugs or something. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, hold on. Scriptwriting Das coming in late here to point out the fact that Moon has dialogue for the eggs of these bastards, which proves that they technically exist, but also Saint is weird, so it's not as we, we don't really know. When Moon gets one of these bitchin' red spheres, she notes that it's full of void fluid, which is why it explodes. In its dormant state, the firebug cells are multiplying at the same rate that they're being consumed by the void fluid, a perfect equilibrium, and that's why they explode when this equilibrium is disrupted. Neat, but it sure as hell doesn't tell us that much about the nature of their existence. Like, I mean, maybe they're actually evolved creatures that live in caves that are exposed to void fluid, and we only see them now because, like, this is the only one that we can really see, but there really is no way to tell. Next up, the stowaway. Ah, stowaways. The infamously elusive cousin of the barnacles from Half-Life. Stowaways can be found in a few set places, always attached to the ceiling in dark underground locations. When a potential prey animal walks beneath the dormant stowaway, it will fire out an array of stinging tendrils that will paralyze them if they hit, before reeling them in and consuming them whole with a mouthful of hook-shaped teeth. Judging at least by their arena icon, it's highly likely that the stowaway is a type of arthropod, though it could also be a creature similar to a cone snail judging by the way that they hunt. They at the very least have some sort of fleshy tendril ending in a venomous harpoon. It could be that they're a larval form of a larger creature, but what would that creature be? Judging by their name, it could also be that the stowaway is so strange and rare because it's just that, a stowaway, coming in from a separate land, perhaps on a train car or something, and eventually arriving in subterranean, growing fat off the easy pickings and lower competition of this new land. Perhaps their adult forms migrate far, far away from the facility grounds, taking refuge deep within the trees of the outer expanse. I'm thinking of some giant dragonfly or something like what the antlion larva becomes. Unfortunately, this is all speculation, because we really don't know anything about the stowaways. We didn't even really know that they existed until like a week or two after Downpour came out. 
Next up, the Reindeer. One of the largest neutral creatures in Rainworld, the annoyingly spelled Reindeer, two different words, are massive creatures that wander through the farm arrays. Their body is oblong and presumably coated in a thick wool that drapes down around their body, with a small head adorned with horns of varying size. Though easily their most confusing feature is their legs. Each reindeer sports four long, five-jointed legs made of seemingly an exoskeleton. These legs confound me. They're kind of like insectoid limbs, but that wouldn't really make sense. This would make it the largest arthropod in the game, and also it seems to have hair and antlers, two distinctly mammalian traits, unless you count the setae found on tarantulas, and like, they're, they're, those aren't made of keratin, they're chitin. It's also nowhere near as thick and heavy as the wool on reindeer. It could also be that their legs are not exoskeleton, but rather just very knobby mammal bits like sinew, muscle, and bone. Which would be strange, because they don't end in feet, but rather in tiny nubs which seem to be able to grip onto surfaces, just like insect legs can. Either way, there's no real method of telling, so I'm just going to move on from these weird-ass legs and onto the other stuff about them. First off, their niche. Reindeer spend most of their time using those aggravatingly inexplicable legs to wander about the flatlands of the farm arrays, staying easily out of range of the most dangerous threat of the area, being the worm grass, which we'll get to. This threat is likely why they adapted those legs in the first place. They seem to be herbivorous, though the only food we see them eat are spore puffs, which are found underground, which they can't naturally reach, so you know, we don't really know. Let's just presume that they eat any fruiting plant or fungus found on the surface. Interestingly as well, the reindeer appear to have a hierarchy system based on the size of their antlers. Somewhat similar to real deer, if they ever cross paths, the small deer will bow their head and let the other pass first. This suggests quite a bit and likely confirms that the antlers matter in fighting other reindeer. Though unlike real deer, every single individual we see has antlers, which would suggest that we only see the males. If it weren't for the fact that actual reindeer, R-E-I-N deer, or caribou, have females with antlers as well. This doesn't really further any of our theories, but like, hey, it's a fun fact, now you know. It does actually suggest another use for their antlers though, fighting off other reindeer for food instead of exclusively for mates, which is what female caribou are thought to use them for. I mean, hey, that's, that's at least pretty neat. Can't say you've learned nothing today. Next up are the Vultures, aka the bane of every new player. The Vultures are a bunch of large bird-adjacent creatures that stalk the skies of Rainworld. Their bodies are rotund, almost circular, with two large wings coming off from either side. Their head lies at the end of a long, flexible neck, and their face is covered with their iconic mask, which we know is made of bone and a composite material. Despite their rotundness, they seem to be able to fly due to the gas that is emitted from the vents atop their shoulders. This purplish gas is emitted primarily on takeoff, but can also be shot out in a constant stream to keep the vulture's body almost completely still while it hovers. Additionally, once they do land, their wings can be moved almost like arms, allowing them to somewhat clumsily scale over harsh terrain to maneuver towards their prey. Once they find their prey, they will grab it and fly off into the skies again, presumably consuming them later. There are also the King Vultures, heftier versions with launchable harpoons that allow it to spear and reel in creatures from a long distance away. My main hypothesis regarding Vultures remains true from last Flora Fauna covering. I believe that they are specialized hunting units. Their unnatural method of locomotion and strange body structure tells us that pretty easily, but their masks are also a good hint. Their masks seem to be an identifier for the vultures, as a vulture without a mask will be attacked by its kin almost like it was a prey item. But to expand on that hunting unit theory, I have an idea that vultures were units that were designed by the ancients while they were living in the Iderator cities. Their purpose could have been to gather animal biomass from below, either for consumption or for study. They could have also been used as pest control or something along those lines. Either way, considering how unusual they are, I find it hard to believe that they're a natural birth. Next up, Mirospurds. Another big fat round bird, the Mirospurds are pack hunting terrestrial predators that sprint across open flat areas and long stretches of land looking for food. 
Their bodies are formed of the same meatball-shaped core as the vultures, but from it sprouts two piston-like legs and a long head that ends in a sharp beak made of two toothy metallic blades. Their large yellow eye also denotes their main strength besides those jaws and the legs, their vision. Miros birds have incredible sight. In fact, their vision is so strong and sensitive that a bright light will notably completely blind them for several seconds, allowing a crafty slug cat to get past them. Though if you find yourself without a flashbang, you're kind of shit out of luck as the Miros bird is insanely fast on those metal legs, and also has a near instant bite time with that sharp beak, which also happens to kill most prey in one quick snap. Now on to the main thing about them. Why are they so clearly artificial? The only statement in Downpour is just five pebbles calling them quote-unquote extremely aggressive and durable purposed organisms, which like, yeah, obviously. But hey, we can still theorize. I still believe to this day that Miros birds and vultures came from the same source. They have too many features alike for me to think otherwise. The shape of their body, the length and prehensibility of their neck, the fact that they are both birds with those features, it suggests a type of base genetic mold, which they were both shaped from. The vultures were modified into more traditional aerial birds of prey, whereas the Miros birds had their wings removed and instead replaced with metal legs that would grant them unparalleled stamina to chase down intruders that would dare to enter the holy crypts where the ancient memories were stored. I wonder if the next creature will confirm or deny this theory. Hmm. Well, I'm sure we'll figure out. Anyway, next up is the Miros Vulture. Ha! <laughs> but hey, before we get into my victory lap, we should probably describe how this nightmarish apex predator actually functions. The Miros Vulture has the framework of a vulture with a very similar hunting strategy and behavior. Except, uh, uh they have a Miros bird head and a laser. Wait, sorry, let me read that again. They have a Miros bird head and a laser? Yep, according to the wiki, they have an explosive laser that they use when threatened. They laser eye your ass. Okay, cool I guess. So yeah, these creatures have a laser. Curiously, a laser that is very similar to the vulture grub's laser. It even makes the same sound, except it explodes at the end. Which I don't think happens with the vulture grub's laser. So besides the explosive, what else is neat about them? Okay, uh, they are much more aggressive, they'll chase you further. Okay, no, I still can't get over the laser eyes. How? I've been forgiving to other sci-fi elements, because, like, that... But, but that's just a Miros bird head. It's not like the laser does any damage on its own. Only the explosion does. So my guess is that it's probably a tracer for a projectile of some kind, except there's no obvious launcher, like what the King Vulture has. So unless the Miros Vulture has rocket launchers in its tear ducts, this feels like a bit of a stretch that we're just supposed to accept without too much theorization. But how does this fit exactly into my previous theory with the Miros birds and regular vultures? Well, I think that the Miros vulture is just another model of this, a much more aggressive and lethal version of the others that is designed to guard Iterator structures, explaining why we only find them around Iterator structures, such as Moon and Pebbles exteriors. I think that works. Okay, let me move on to a creature that makes more sense. Next up, the Rot. Uh, okay, I guess the murder boogers make more sense than the laser bird. The Rot is a title that specifically includes the Proto Long Legs, Daddy Long Legs, Brother Long Legs, and Mother Long Legs creatures. They're fundamentally all the same thing an extension of the cancerous growth eating the iterator known as Five Pebbles from the inside out. So, what started the Rot? Well, it's heavily implied that the thing that started the Rot was an experiment to make a genome to rewrite the genetic code of an iterator to allow for one to circumvent the self-destruction taboo. This was the result of a failed or interrupted experiment, a ravenous mass of cells that forms into cysts and propagates without stopping. It's literally just bigger cancer, so rot starts the cells that consume biomass and grow further before splitting, as cells do, eventually forming into a cyst that extends out tendrils to find further food. This form, that is still connected to the wall, is called a proto-longlegs, and are the youngest versions by far. Once they get large enough, they split off into a mobile form known as a daddy longlegs, which are capable of traversing the area in search of even more food to grow and split further. They find food through touch, but mainly through sound, extending a limb towards any notable source of vibrations in the room to hopefully catch a creature and consume it. We can 
presume that mother long legs are born from particularly successful cyst patches. Either that or through the corruption of an inspector, which feels a bit too game theory for me, but I'm mentioning it because it could be the case and I want to cover all my bases. Either way, after a mobile cyst has existed for a bit too long, it will devolve into a smaller form. Mother long legs devolve into daddy long legs and daddy long legs to brother long legs. Brother long legs are the smallest forms, having lost their acute sense of hearing and relying solely on touch now. The brothers are small enough to potentially lose to enough firepower from scavengers or a well-armed slug cat. The ones in garbage waste have even taken on a greenish color, which suggests that the color of the non-black parts of the rot cysts change depending on what they consume. The ones in five pebbles are blue because they've, I mean, he's got a lot of blue in him, and the older ones in the garbage wastes are green as they have consumed mostly sewage and trash. But what happens when rot dies? Well, we get an answer. They seemingly solidify, leaving behind an immobile blob where a living cyst used to be. You can see these all over the rot and silent construct areas. Next up, the giant jellyfish. Easily my favorite creature in the game, the sessile giant jellyfish seems very familiar to the smaller jellyfish at first glance, but its body structure is actually pretty damn different. Alongside the fact that it can actually be found fully submerged, which the smaller jellyfish cannot be, the giant jellyfish seems to take after more traditional jellyfish. According to the wiki, it could be inspired by the giant phantom jellyfish, which like, I don't really see, but hey, it's, it's been a long video and we both need a break. So let's take a quick intermission by looking at my favorite species of jellyfish. That was great. Everybody all rested up? You get some water, get yourself a snack, still got a long ass way to go. Ready to keep going with the video? I'm not. Let's keep going. Giant jellyfish are found sitting stationary on the water's surface, or found swimming up and down beneath the water's surface. They hunt by extending their tentacles actively towards prey, and then pulling them towards the orb at the center of their body, before delivering a lethal electrical shock to anything that they manage to get that close. Interestingly as well, if one kills a giant jellyfish, they split up into bulbs of slime mold and specks of general white bits. The white bits are just their exterior flesh, but the slime mold is interesting. While I'm fully aware that the slime mold is just there because it's orange and looks vaguely like what you'd expect the giant jellyfish's guts to look like, I, I'm here to speculate. So we're taking this as if it's actually, like, an important thing about their biology. So, I have a theory. What if the jellyfish is cultivating the slime mold in its guts to help it digest larger prey? Either that, or the slime mold is the source of their electricity, but that doesn't really feel realistic. We see the orange bulb in the center of its body, so that's probably where the slime mold is stored for some reason. The giant jellyfish is found exclusively in submerged superstructure, but in Saint they're also found in shoreline. My theory is that the giant jellyfish are large open ocean predators that drifted ashore and got caught within Moon's recently fallen wreckage, before eventually escaping it inland to reach shoreline in time for Saint's campaign. Considering they are jellyfish, this drifting lifestyle is a highly likely cause for their presence within Moon's superstructure. Next up, the Leviathan. The largest hostile creature in the game. The Leviathans are the terrors of Rainworld's depths. Their bodies are long and serpentine, with an excessively long tail that trails off in whatever direction they just swam from. Their bodies are marked on either side by a large amount of sail-like fins, more similar to the leaves of kelp than of actual functional fins. They swim like eels, undulating their body as they move, pursuing their prey, which is literally anything in the water that is smaller than them. I'm not, I'm not even exaggerating. Well, I mean, obviously they don't chase batflies, but like, this is their goddamn aggression sheet. Notice how they have a full desire to eat literally everything else in the game? Yeah, they're, they're able to perform such acts of bravery through their incredibly powerful mechanical jaws. 
Their mouths are made up of two pieces of thick metal that clamp together at incredible speed, instantly crushing any organic material between them in a paste to be fed down the throat. This bite is so strong it can kill anything in the game. It literally doesn't do damage, it just kills the thing. These monstrous creatures are only found in deep water, primarily in shoreline and submerged superstructure. Leviathans are rather obviously mechanical and purposed in nature, but what were they purposed for? Well, before Downpour, you found people, including myself, stating that Leviathans were designed to defend Moon's legs. But after Downpour, we can see that Moon's legs were connected to Waterfront Facility, where no Leviathans can be found. This implies that Leviathans, similar to the giant jellyfish, lived out in the greater seas, hunting on their own. Which means that for some reason the ancients were creating leviathans and then just loosing them out into the open water. It could be that leviathans were designed as underwater bodyguards for the moon legs that we can't see, or for other areas, but we only see them near moon and also in subterranean. Oh right, the subterranean leviathan. Subterranean houses a albino leviathan in the giant underground lake. It's neat, but doesn't really tell us much besides the fact that they can be albino, and so can jetfish. Either way, uh, no matter what confusing purpose they were created for, the leviathans we see now are likely the same that existed since the time of the ancients. Either that, or they're connecting the hydraulic presses to their young on their own. Next up, Iterators. Iterators are city-sized superstructures that hold trillions of cell networks designed into a supercomputer with a downright incomprehensible amount of processing power. That was a pretty solid intro to the Iterators, right? Oh, trust me, it's a lot more complicated. Due to the nature of the Iterator being essentially a hive of many different moving parts, most of which take on the form of creatures in the game for the Slugat to interact with, we're going to have to talk about each one of them individually. Starting with the Overseers. The Overseers are the eyes and ears of the Iterators. Small, worm-like constructs with one large eye in the center that captures footage and sends it directly to the Iterator's storage drives. They sport a variety of colors that designates the Iterator which they came from. For example, the yellow ones belong to Look to the Moon, and the blue ones belong to Five Pebbles. Their eye appears to be the only physical portion of their body, and is a round piece of machinery connected by a wire to the rest of their body. It's my guess that the remainder of its body is some sort of hologram, seeing as how it doesn't leave behind a corpse, and the eye has been shown to be able to project holograms several feet away from itself. The Overseers are also capable of transmitting information to one another through the usage of several small tendrils extending from the eye, which might also be physical wires, but we really don't know. They connect these tendrils with other individuals in order to transmit information between each other. Now for the hard part, how do they move? Well, Overseers are capable of zipping from one side of the screen to the other almost instantly, popping in and out of the ground as if they were teleporting. It's my guess that the Overseers are capable of exceedingly fast travel due to the fact that most of their body is a hologram, but it still feels very sci-fi for them to be that fast without any clear mobility tools. I got nothing, but I felt like I should mention it anyways because it, you know, it stumps me. Next up, the Neuron Flies, small processing units found within Iterator innards. Neuron Flies take on very simple forms, just a main body with two mobility tendrils coming out that allow them to traverse through zero-g spaces with ease, but grant them little to no movement otherwise. Most individuals do display hovering capabilities in regular gravity, but they don't seem to be able to move anywhere near as well in zero-g. Neuron Flies spend most of their time darting about Iterator innards, transmitting signals from one place to another, they seem to function as, well, neurons, brain cells, considering that Moon, who has a very low amount of them, will literally stop functioning if they are all gone, as if her entire processing power is placed into just the neuron flies. This also suggests that neuron flies are capable of storing at least a notable amount of data. But this is also likely because Moon's umbilical is severed and she has to rely on the neuron flies, but we'll get to that. Neuron flies are also edible, but have the side effect of making specifically slug cats which eat them begin to emit light passively. They also appear to be codable to contain several pieces of data and processes, as no significant harassment is capable of coding a green neuron to carry slag keys to help bring Moon back to semi-functionality. 
Next up are the Inspectors, the largest creatures naturally found in Iterator superstructures besides Rot that we can see. Inspectors are many-headed floating protectors of the Iterator's internals. Each of their heads is tipped with a dexterous group of manipulating limbs that allow them to grab and throw things like spears with surprising accuracy. They use this skill to defend the Iterator internals from creatures like Hungry Slugcats seeking to diminish the processing power of the greater superstructure by consuming a neuron fly. When angered, the Inspector will glow a bright red and begin hurling anything it can pick up at the attacker with surprising ferocity, until they leave its sight or die. Another interesting behavior of Inspectors is that they will actively save you from stationary hazards such as shock walls or proto long legs if they aren't angered. This could be out of a desire to not have to clean burnt slug cat off the floor or not to feed the rot more. It seems like the Inspector's primary duties are to maintain and defend the systems, as they will also show signs of aggression towards rot cysts. If an Inspector dies, it will poof into the same sparks as an Overseer and leave behind three Inspector Eyes, which appear to be larger variants of Overseer Eyes that are contained within each head. This likely means that Inspectors have more in common with Overseers than Neuron Flies, and that they are most likely made of holograms. The final Iterator specific creature that we see are the Puppets, which is the arguable body of the Greater Iterator's consciousness. The Puppet is a small humanoid body found within the Puppet Chamber near the top middle of Iterator structures. We don't get much info on Iterator Puppets in terms of biology, but they seem to have at least some form of skin that surrounds what we can presume to be bones. Their head sports two large black eyes and no visible mouth. They also possess two modules on the sides of their heads, which can either have antennas sticking up or not have antennas sticking up, seemingly dependent on the model of the Iterator. The clothes found on Iterator puppets are rather rudimentary, seemingly only being cloth shawls. Though sometimes you'll see accessories like No Significant Harassment scarf. Behind the head of an Iterator puppet sits their halo, a large hologram that seems to change depending on their thought patterns, and occasionally lances out white bolts of energy towards the nearby walls. Iterator puppets are connected to their structure through their umbilical, a giant metal arm that connects to their middle back. This umbilical transmits signals from the puppet to the body, and vice versa. It seems like an Iterator's main personality is contained within the puppet, as the puppet appears to be the last bastion of consciousness in both mostly destroyed Iterators we see. While the puppet itself possesses barely any processing power, it still is usually enough to keep itself upright and string together a few sentences with the help of a few neurons or functional processors. Puppets also seem to possess the ability to lift up and telekinetically hold creatures, as well as the ability to instantly kill most creatures through what I can only describe as a blast to the brain. Now think about how cool it would be here if Challenge 70 was canon, and I could talk about all the cool Toho shit Sliver of Straw does. But either way, yeah. I'm presuming that this brain blast is actually a super concentrated electromagnetic signal that essentially just shorts out every connection in both Overseer's and Slugcat's brains alike, literally just stopping their upper brain functions. Fucked up. Overall, Iterators are incredibly complicated, and I can't really be bothered to line out every section of their greater whole, like their exteriors or their internal important areas that we can see. I could honestly make a whole video about Iterator structures and what makes them tick, but I'll not get into it too much here. I'll put it on the patron polls from here on out though, so vote for that one if you feel like it. Next up, The Guardian. Oh god, here we go. We're getting into the fucked up cycle voidy creatures now, and man, I do not know what's going on with them. So we're hard pivoting from a mostly biological focus to complete lore theorization now. Yeah! So, Guardians, the big fuckers that populate the depths, what's up with them? Well, they seem to be, as their name suggests, Guardians of the Void Sea, preventing any creature without the requisite amount of karma from ascending, likely to prevent the creation of more echoes, as we see with Artificer. Their body plans consist of a large rectangular head with the Karma 10 symbol on it that is connected to what looks like an ovular torso with several tentacle-like legs that keep them upright. Behind their heads sit a very similar halo of light to the ones on Iterator puppets, though the ones behind the Guardians appear more like clocks, with several spinning rings of numbered glyphs seen literally nowhere else in the game, and moving circles that hover over them. This is a 
downright incomprehensible, so we'll skip over it. When a guardian is met with a creature that does not have that requisite amount of karma, it will utilize its telekinetic manipulation power, seemingly the same telekinetic lifting power as the iterators, and they will throw away the intruder around two times before they become aggressive. When they're aggressive, they will use their power to dispatch intruders by dribbling them like a fucking basketball until they die. Their halo will also grow, and their face symbol will glow a bright red. Now, in Rubicon, guardians act as blockades to the saint, locking room doors and spawning in deadly creatures to attempt to kill saint. The reason why they specifically want to kill saint and guard Rubicon is probably because they know what saint is doing and don't like it. I wish they would tell me what saint is doing, because I still don't know. But yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to stop the saint by utilizing their apparent power to create life and also hold doors shut. Neat. They're also particularly resilient to saint's powers, taking three ascensions to kill instead of just one. Now for the origin of the guardians. It's my guess that they're automatons, purposed organisms designed by the ancients for the purpose of halting their creation of echoes. Which might be why they hate saints, but we don't know. They don't appear to need food or water or any form of sustenance, so maybe they're a bit more mystical than that, but they are just one of the most mysterious things in the game, so you know, not too much to grasp at there. Also a, a cool fact that I found, in the like second room of outskirts that we see after the tutorial, there's graffiti of the guardians. I just think that's really cool foreshadowing and I didn't realize it until I read the wiki. Anyway, next up, the Echoes. Echoes can't really be defined as creatures, but I'm putting them here so people don't get mad at me. I made a whole video on them, so watch that for their lore, but I'm making a self-help decision by keeping this short. Echoes are ancients that failed to ascend, having their forms corrupted and changed and their minds stuck in place, locked away from everything else until their cycles overlap with another's. They are capable of giving the Slogat a karma boost upon meeting them and still seem to be sane capable of experiencing change and possessing memories, as well as making new ones. Echoes take on the form of large black floating creatures with several drifting tendrils. They possess golden scales on what I can semi-confidently call their head and arms. These scales seem to fall off and fall from the sky in an area around them when they appear. The coloration of the landscape also becomes a washed out blue whenever they appear, that seems to screw with the wildlife and makes them much less active. It's unclear if this aura is an intentional act by the Echo, potentially an attempt to meet the individual whose cycle they have overlapped with, or if it's just a thing that happens around them passively. Echoes speak in the same language as they did when they were alive, and are only capable of being understood with the mark of communication, though they will still give their karma to one who can't understand them. As for why they look that way, I still retain my theory that the Echo is a melted, morphed version of an ancient, their clothing and jewelry fusing with their skin to form those golden scales and floating tendrils, and their extremities being lost or elongated into the arms and head of the Echo. It's not strictly likely, but it's the best I got, and I still think it's one of the coolest theories I've come up with. Alright, the Void Worm. Finally, we reach the last piece of fauna in the game, and it's easily the least explained one, but it's also the coolest, so, you know, that, that, that's how it is. The Void Worms are gargantuan creatures, dwarfing everything but the Iterators in scale, that live exclusively in the Void Sea, a great infinite well of very confusing lore fluid that interrupts the repetition of the cycles. The bodies of the Void Worms are unknowably long, and possess several segments all the way down to their thin tails. They possess giant fins that let them swim very quickly. Their size mixed with this speed forms a current so strong it pushes the slug hat in the direction the worm was swimming in, just by being near it. Their heads possess a number of manipulating limbs, as well as a small head at the end of the tentacle, possessing two bright golden eyes. This head also appears to emit a bright golden light, which is so bright that it can be seen even from the very depths of the void seat. Oh yeah, uh, I forgot to mention it, but there's like an arguably endless amount of void worms. They swim in the upper layers of the void sea constantly, their lights heading off into the distance, a constant moving field of star-like light that stretches into infinity. But enough of the poetic writing, what are void worms? Well, besides the fact that they're the only other living entities we see in the void sea besides ourselves or the things in the cutscene that we can presume are residents of the void sea, or they're just like hallucinations. My theory is that void worms are essentially just 
outer gods, infinitely swimming forever, an embodiment of the cycle as constantly swimming entities that merely watch as civilizations fall and dive into their domain as time ever so slowly scrapes by, content to swim in their same patterns until nothing is left, and past even that. It could also be argued that they're ascended ancients, but I honestly think that's a bit too small for these things. They seem much bigger than that lore-wise, like they were here before the ancients, they'll be here after the Iterators, and they will be here even after the very last civilization falls to the void. Their ambitions unknown if they have any at all, a truly eldritch representation of something that exists past everything that lives. Alright, holy hell, that's all the fauna done, only took me 30 pages of script in 3 months. Now onto the flora, which should hopefully be a lot less painful. If you made it this far, uh, make sure to subscribe, you clearly like my videos if you made it through all my shit for this long. Thanks, and let's get a move on. Starting off the flora list with the slime mold. Uh, this is going to be pretty easy. If you didn't know, slime mold exists in real life. Well, not the kind that glows orange and arranges itself into six inch wide bulbs, but still. Orange slime mold exists. Slime molds are a type of fungi that feed primarily on bacteria and are known for their very odd appearance and growth patterns, moving almost more like an amoeba than any fungus, even being capable of solving mazes through something other than just brute force like most other plant roots can. They're very strange, but the slime molds we see in Rain World are much, much simpler in terms of their effect on gameplay. By all means, they are just differently colored blue fruit, growing along the walls of dark areas and forming into bulbs that can be consumed by Slugcat. As for their unusual growing habits, I have a theory that the ancients initially purposed the slime molds to fit into small, well, molds, and they form into round structures because they were originally purposed to fit into small, presumably circular spaces. This could be either for them to emit light or for them to produce electricity, which would also explain why they exist in the guts of the giant jellyfish. This would also explain their presence in the darker areas, as those areas would have contained lights that could have broken, letting the slime mold out, or contained advanced power structures that use them any different number of reasons. Next up, the dandelion peach. Wowee, another horribly boring plant that exists only to be eaten by Slugcat and nothing else. Well, I guess the dandelion peach does look kinda neat. Dandelion peaches are seemingly a type of flower or fruit that grow exclusively in the sun-drenched sky islands. They have a very simple body plan, like most plants that we're going to discuss. Just a plain stalk that ends in the important gameplay thing. Uh, this being the fruit, one might even say a peach, which is surrounded by white fluff similar to a dandelion. I wonder how we could have guessed this. The dandelion part of their anatomy, being the white fluff, allows them to fall a lot slower than most other plants when in freefall. This suggests that they adapt a similar seed sowing strategy to dandelions. Eventually, the high winds in the Sky Islands will disconnect the bulb from its stalk and carry it far away where it can likely release its seed-rich payload. Moon mentions that the plant is filled with sticky goo and many seeds, and theorizes that the goo will rot and feed the seeds as they germinate. But she also mentions that the floating is a defense mechanism, which doesn't make any sense. But I'm just gonna say that I'm smarter than the literal diaphic supercomputer designed to be smart, because it makes it easier for me. Next up, the glowweed. Oh shit, it's one of the most boring plants in the entire game. This flora section sure has been riveting, hasn't it? The glowweed is a type of underwater bulb plant, likely a form of kelp or seaweed. Presumably the latter, because weed is in its name. The main body of the glowweed consists of what I'd like to call a bulb, because bladder sounds a whole lot worse even if it is more accurate, which is filled with pressurized air. These sorts of bulbs or bladders can be found on bladder kelp in real life as well, and these bladders are used to help the plant maintain an upright position in the water column. This could be the same reason why the glowweed does it, but I doubt uh, that that's the case because kelp mostly does it to get as much oxygen and sunlight as possible which would need it to be upright, but glowweed live in mostly dark underwater places without too many currents. So I'm gonna put in another theory. Glowweed were designed as decorative lighting for fully submerged areas. That's it. We don't really get much else in relation to glowweed, so that's my theory. Uh, like and subscribe. Alright, next up, the lily puck. Another comparably boring plant at first glance, the lily pucks actually contain a hefty chunk of actual concrete lore, 
That confirms a few theories. But I'll get to that later. Lily pucks are stalk-like glowing flowers found floating in still pools of water, their main body connected to the rest of their body through a thin stem. They serve as both food and potentially a bit of defense, as when picked up, they can be thrown by the slug cat to nail anything with a blow comparable to what a spear can do. So where's the concrete lore? It just seems like a sharp flower. Well, I mean, it, it kinda is. But if you take one to Moon, she mentions that lily pucks were actually a form of organic lighting for underground machinery. And because of this, their roots are similar to a flexible glass cable, and when broken off, become quite sharp. This confirms that even a comparably mundane looking plant like the lily pucks could have ended up being fully purposed by the ancients. This bit of information recontextualizes a lot of the theories on purposed organisms. Perhaps the lizard heads were purposed, their strength being because they were designed to deflect things even stronger than spears, perhaps. I definitely didn't expect the lily pucks to reveal this, but hey, that's, that's Rain World. Also, the info is funny because it means that the slug cats are eating glass. Next up on the list is the bubble fruit. Yet another bog-standard food plant, the bubble fruit can normally be found near water in the form of a hard little dry plant nugget. They are completely inedible in this form, being so hard that they are identical to the pieces of rubbish laying about in terms of functionality. However, when exposed to moisture, either from being submerged in water or from rivulets' wet-ass hands, they will rapidly expand almost instantly with a pop. Once properly expanded, they take on the form of, well, a bubble and are fully edible though it presumably tastes mostly like bitter water. My guess is that this swollen form is used as a method for carrying their seeds to new places, be that either by floating across large bodies of water or through pipes, or by being consumed and shit out by creatures that would take advantage of the plant's newfound edibility. I'm tempted to say that the former is the case, because bubble fruit is more often found just barely next to bodies of still water, suggesting that after a long drifting journey, the seed-carrying plant was caught on that shore and decomposed, depositing the seeds into a fertile bed of growth medium. Next up, the gooey duck. Okay, now this is finally the last bog-standard food plant. The gooey duck, spelled like this for some reason, real-life gooey ducks exist, spelled like this instead of the more phonetic spelling used in Rainworld, and they're the weird penis clams, which don't really have anything to do with the gooey ducks in Rainworld, but it's still kind of funny because, I mean... Look at them, they're kind of silly, right? Either way, the gooey ducks in this game are described by Moon as an ancient species of dangling mold that exudes smelly liquid spores. Unpleasant to think about, but apparently they're nutritious enough to give two food pips when eaten. They hang from cave ceilings using sticky black fibers, and cover their main body with what appears to be a thick shell of these same fibers, which Slugcat has to remove by seemingly using their teeth to get at the delicious mold in the middle. Interestingly as well, the gooey ducks have another usage. They repel worm grass. I'll expand more on my theories as to why when we get to the worm grass section. Hint, it has to do with their stinkiness. Next up on the list, the mushroom. Finally, we can move on to the utility plants, which all are significantly more interesting than just the eat it and it's done plants. Starting off with the mushroom. A small white, traditionally bell-capped mushroom they grow in dark, damp places like most mushrooms do, likely feeding off the detritus that accumulates in such places. When a slug cat eats a mushroom, they will proceed to suffer the effects of what you'd expect from eating random mushrooms that you find in caves. They don't seem to hallucinate or suffer many negative effects at all. Rather, it seems like the mushrooms serve as a muscle stimulant and reflex booster, likely something along the lines of adrenaline, at least for the latter aspect. This boost allows the slug cats to see in slow motion, as well as both move faster and jump higher for a limited amount of time. The boost only lasts for about 20 seconds before wearing off with seemingly little side effects, though Moon implies otherwise as she advises the slug cat to not eat too many of them. It really is a shame. No significant harassment never did recover from their crippling shrooms addiction. But why did the mushroom develop this sort of behavior? Well, I have two theories. Either they were purposed to create the muscle stimulant for all the ancient hippies, or they developed this because the compound that causes this is exceedingly poisonous to what would be their predators, perhaps some of the smaller insects or something like that. Either one of these theories works, but due to the nature of the creatures in Rainworld, I think the former makes more sense. Next up are the Karma Flowers. Okay, how the fuck do I talk about the Karma Flower? 
Like, how does one talk biologically about a flower that only affects the lore-based mechanic that facilitates the arguable bending of time? Well, luckily, good old Moon comes to the rescue. Moon speaks specifically about the Karma Flower as a hallucinogenic plant. In fact, let me just read out what she says to y'all. This is a hallucinogenic plant. They used to call it a wheel flower. It became the symbol for enlightenment as it momentarily enabled a creature to let go of its carnal self and to contact the selves of other planes. Dreams, memories, imagined worlds. Very long ago, they would eat these and stare into the fire. So, I'm not entirely sure what to make of that. It could be that after eating a karma flower, the cycle that occurs in which you die is an alternate world or something. It's so very vague, but that's just the highest likelihood. As to why the Karma Flower evolved like this, off-screen void shenanigans notwithstanding, it could be that the hallucinogenic nature of the flower was designed to keep predators away, as most poisonous plants are. This is honestly the weirdest plant we'll see, because it's arguable if it has connections to the void at all. It's yellow like the void, and it seems to be almost ethereal in how it's rendered. But that doesn't really confirm much on its own. If I was to go real out there, I'd suggest that it's almost a manifestation of, like, the void itself that's essentially sprouted up from just the ground itself. But again, that's that's just me being real game theory about it. Next up, the Batnip. A significantly more boring plant, the Batnip has more or less one functionality, and it's literally just something that normal plants will do. The Batnip appears like some orangish fern or a vague leafy plant that grows relatively uncommonly across the area. They do one important thing, and that is the fact that they can attract batflies to themselves. This is likely done for pollination, though if we're going with the idea that they're ferns, spreading spores, I guess, the batflies don't seem to eat the plant, they just hang out around it, which I suppose is why it's called Batnip. It doesn't serve as food for the plant, the smell just sends them into a craze. In fact, the batfly attracting property seems to last even after the plant has died, as even when it's been picked up and stored away for a while, it still maintains its unique abilities. I don't really have much to say, it's literally just a red fern with the ability to attract bugs. Next up, the bubble weed. Okay, this one confused me for a bit, but I'll get into that in a moment. Bubbleweed is an unusual plant that grows adjacent to small bodies of water, most commonly found in draining system. Their body plan consists of a single long stem that connects to several air bladders, very similar to the glowweed's air bladder, in fact. The interesting thing is that when submerged, these bladders will pop and release their air slowly into the water around them. This could also be something that Slurgat does when underwater with them, like you might squeeze them until they explode so we can get the air. I'm not entirely sure, either way it's weird. Besides Karma Flowers, these are probably the most video gamey plant in Rain World. They don't really have any logical reasoning as to why they would develop like this. So I have a theory. It's the same one I use for the bubble fruit, except on a bigger scale. These air sacs eventually ripen and fall off the plant into the water, getting carried on to another place to deposit what is likely a seed of some kind. This theory is kind of shitty, but it's the only one that I've got. I don't like this plant. It doesn't really make sense. Next up, the Spore Puff. A much more understandable and interesting piece of flora, the Spore Puff is a type of fungus that grows in underground chambers and farmeries. The actual puff itself that you can hold is the flowering body of the fungus, and hangs from strands of mycelium from the ceiling of caves. The Spore Puff itself contains, you guessed it, spores, lots of them, at very high pressure. Any rupture or intense pressure on the side of the spore puff will cause it to explode, spraying spores everywhere. This is almost entirely harmless to anything, unless you're an arthropod. If you are an arthropod, which is to say any of these creatures that I'm showing on screen right here, the spores act as essentially a kill box, doing enough damage to instantly kill almost any of the listed creatures, except for red centipedes, I suppose. Also, firebugs aren't affected, which is weird. Either way, my guess for why this is the case is a cool one, because it has IRL evidence. My guess is that the spore puff is a type of cordyceps, or a type of fungus that spreads through insects. Literally, it spreads through insects. The cordyceps fungus is known for the ghastly scenes it will leave behind when it's done with its host. They spread usually through the insect consuming food, which has been lightly dusted with the spores released by the flowering body. So how does this apply to Rain World? Well, I think that spore puffs have such high pressure and grow where they do, because if a centipede or other creature nudges them a bit too hard, the spore puff could explode, filling the creature with deadly spores that quickly get to work in consuming it to form more spore puffs. 
It is likely that they primarily prey on centipedes, as there are quite a few more centipedes in farmeries than there are spiders or noodleflies. But the big question is what happens to the insect carcass? Well, uh, that's, that's, that's pretty hard to answer. But I suppose that they could just be buried or consumed in totality by the spore puff. Next up, the corn bud. Another food plant. This time it's actually a good bit more interesting, though. When dormant, the corn bud looks almost like a long corn stalk with only one abnormally large ear of corn at the top. The secret of this big cob lies when you hit it with a spear. Only a spear works, not a rock, weirdly, but once doing so, the leaves covering the cob will split off and the kernels will all rapidly pop into an array of popcorn-like seed structures. We now know that this is intentional, as the individual popped structures are talked about by Moon as an intentional design of this plant, or a seed-bearing structure, which sounds like it isn't the result of some horrible malfunction. Either way, once the corn bud has popped, it only has about a cycle left before all the remaining seeds on the plant vanish, either due to decay or other creatures eating them, we don't really know, but it has a very low shelf life once popped either way. The corn bud has so many seeds in it that naturally it functions as an infinite food source for the cycle. Interestingly as well, in the Saint campaign, the corn bud pops when it gets cold enough. The red coloration on the leaves will turn black before it just kind of gives up the ghost and scatters the seed structures everywhere. This doesn't seem to be the intentional method of seed spreading, as Moon mentions how fucked up the inside of the seed structure is after being frozen. You can also pop the corn bud by uh, ascending it, apparently. You can use Saint's Brain Blast to pop the corn bud. Not sure how that works, but I felt the need to state it either way. My final theory for why the corn bud functions like this is in order for its seeds to be spread much easier through being consumed by creatures. This is literally the reason in real life why sweet fruits were adapted in the first place. Seeds are strong enough to often survive in the bellies of creatures like bears or deer, and make it out into their feces, from which the seeds can then germinate and grow into trees far away from their parents. This is likely the same philosophy that the corn bud uses, as there would be little other reason for it to make such an obviously edible seed structure in such abundance, besides wanting to be consumed. Next up, the Cherry Bomb. This plant is very interesting. It's described by Moon as a branch of a plant called a fire bush, but uh, we only get to see the branch, and it's called a Cherry Bomb on the wiki, so it's kind of hard to tell what the greater plant looks like. The Cherry Bomb is the source of most of the explosives used by the scavengers, as it can apparently be harvested and refined into something called fire powder. This fire powder is presumably stored inside the nuts along the plant's stem, and Upon being disturbed, the flammable powder inside will pop, creating a loud noise that can knock out the hearing of any creature standing too close for a good period of time. This noise seems to frighten larger creatures such as lizards, which might be a hint as to why this was developed. There's always the possibility that it was just purposed as a way to make bombs, probably for digging because of the whole ancients hate violence thing. They probably wouldn't be bombing each other. However, it most likely survived due to this adaptation, as any creature that would walk too close to either eat it or simply by pushing past it would likely cause the nuts to go off, scaring away the creatures and preventing them from doing it again. It's the same sort of philosophy behind poisonous creatures having super bright colors, except on a plant. A plant that explodes. Next up, the flashbang. Oh wow, I wonder what this plant does. The flashbang is another explosive plant, this time found specifically in dark areas. The main flashbang plant appears to be a long purplish vine which creates the flashbang itself, which is the fruit. Judging by the places that they grow, it could be that this is a fungus of some kind, considering the lack of sunlight it seems to need. Unfortunately, Moon is of absolutely no help to us, as she only calls it a plant, which could be seen as a general term for any type of flora, but could also be seen as a method of disproving the fungus theory. Either way, whatever this piece of flora is classified as seems to only have one fruiting body at the end of its stem, which appears to even weigh the plant down a bit as it constantly droops while the fruit is on it. This fruit passively glows, but when thrown against a hard surface, it will burst into a bright flash of purple light that lasts for a few seconds. This suggests that the flash itself is not instant, but an ongoing chemical reaction similar to thermite rather than magnesium. Either way, this light is so bright that it blinds most creatures. Even the guardians aren't immune. It can even prove fatal to some of the smaller spiders, which will die instantly upon being caught in the light. 
My theory as to why the flashbangs adapted this way, presuming they weren't just designed for it by the ancients, is as a defense mechanism. Perhaps darkness-dwelling plant eaters were a threat to it in the past, so it developed this way to deal with them similar to the cherry bomb. Though there's always the possibility that this explosive nature is also a method of dispersing seeds, as perhaps the force of the chemical reaction sends small spores flying in all directions, some of which will eventually germinate into another flashbang vine. The reason why I mention this seed flinging theory now about the flashbang and didn't mention it with the cherry bomb is that the cherry bomb is part of a fire bush. Bush is usually a word used to mean plants. Plants don't use spores. Funguses, whether or not this is a fungus, obviously still withstanding, do use spores. And there are already examples in real life of fungus literally exploding to spread their spores further. Best example is the stump puffball. Next up, the pain cone or beehive if you go by its more boring name. These are yet another dangerous plant, though not quite explosive. The pain cones are yet another single stem plant, though these ones are odd as they uh, seem to actively move a lot more. Like properly move, they will flee from you and rise when the slug cat gets near it, which could mean that this plant is m a much more active organism, which isn't quite unheard of. In fact, every piece of flora from here on out is a very active organism. The pain cone is known for its main structure, a pine cone shaped thing that seemingly houses tens of small black and red insects. When a slug cat or other large enough creature gets close enough to the pain cone, it will open up and release the insects into the area surrounding it. These insects appear to be traditional creatures, but it's kind of confusing. They fly around, leaving behind bright red tracers behind them, and connect threads to the creature they were released to deal with. These threads appear to be the same type that holds up the gooey duck, but that might just be a coincidence. They bind the creature in place for a while. It's likely that this also hurts quite a bit, judging by the name of Pain Cone, but until we get 4D Rain World with accurate pain physics, there's no real way to tell. Now for the most interesting part of the Pain Cone for theorization. After the insects finish their attack, they fall off, seemingly dead, leaving the Pain Cone looking a bit shagged in comparison. So why do the bugs die upon defending their colony? Well, it's my guess that the pain cone plant has formed a complete symbiosis with the insects. It likely gives them both food and shelter. This means that the bugs have complete faith in the pain cone plant to protect their young and rear up the next generation, which is likely why the plant moves away from any creatures that approach it. It's still confusing though. Perhaps I'm wrong and the insects are actually just parts of the plant, but... Hey, that's the fun part of analyzing black dots that consist of about 12 pixels, is what I would say. But there's actually proof that the pain cone bugs are in fact bugs. If they are hit with a spore puff, the insects don't act, presumably out of fear of the spores, allowing the slug cat to freely pick up the pain cone without it activating. Ha! That doesn't really prove that much, but it, it's, it's evidence. It's better than nothing. Next up, the wormgrass, one of the last three carnivorous plants on this list. The wormgrass is what appears to be a patch of tube-like plant structures of varying length and color. Each structure is tipped with a small blue circle. Wormgrass can be mostly found on the left side of the map, primarily in farm arrays and outer expanse. Black wormgrass are likely the younger variants and are found in smaller areas, primarily in pits and open expanses that are already littered with obstacles. Red wormgrass, on the other hand, is much, much larger, and is found in giant patches in open areas exposed to the sun. When wormgrass successfully spots a creature, it will point its body towards that creature, even if they're a lot farther away. If the creature gets within range, the wormgrass will attach onto it and begin to seemingly attempt to pull it underground. The more wormgrass that's attached to a single target, the harder it will become for them to move, and the easier it will be for them to get pulled underground. Big enough patches of red wormgrass can even take down creatures as large as vultures. They seem to feed on any size of creature, but will primarily target creatures that would need to pass through them regularly, like slug cats, lizards, egg bugs, and scavengers. Though green lizards are immune to it for whatever reason. My theory for how they're so lethal is pretty simple. That blue dot is the outline of their mouth, a sharp ring of teeth that cuts into the creature and begins to drain it of its blood. This also explains the increased exhaustion as creatures are grabbed by the wormgrass. Now wormgrass does seem to function off of sight, though I'm not sure how they would have developed eyes, so it could be that they function off body heat. 
in game terms they function strictly off of sight, but there's always the possibility that that's just a shortcut. My personal theory is that they function off of smell or chemical signals. This would make sense as a lot of plants already react to chemical signals, though in a far less violent manner, and it would also explain why the wormgrass hates gooby ducks so much. It is always contradicted by the fact that the code dictates that they can see things, but like, hey, we're here to speculate, so we're gonna fucking speculate. Next up, the pole plant, second to last plant, and another example of something that is probably not actually a plant, but hey, it's, it's literally in the name, so who can say? The pole plant is a long stalk plant with two red and black leaves on either side of that stalk. The pole plant is an ambush predator that, you guessed it, disguises as a pole. They do this by wrapping their leaves around their stalk, hiding the red interior and using the black exterior to make the whole thing look rather convincing, though a brush from a creature will displace the leaves and reveal its facade. If a creature is foolish enough to mistake the dormant pole plant for a pole and attempt to climb it, it will open up and use its leaves to grab onto the target. Their leaves probably have an array of small hook-like hairs or something along those lines which allows them to get a better grip as they attempt to pull their prey down into their den, which likely contains an underground stomach of sorts to, you know, digest the creature. Pole plants are strong enough to contend with even the strongest of lizards and centipedes, only ignoring the largest of creatures like reindeer, mirosperds, and rot. For the most part, pole plants are fragile, however, and will let go of their target if damaged enough. The best way to see this in action is by throwing a spear at a pole plant that is grabbing you, which will cause it to let you go and ride around for a bit. Once a pole plant has taken enough damage, it will die, vanishing into its den and never emerging for the rest of the cycle. Finally, the monster kelp. Gigantic aggressive flora. The monster kelp appears to be a similar species to the pole plant, considering you can lineage them from pole plants. The difference is that monster kelp makes zero attempt to conceal itself besides just kind of standing still. The monster kelp takes the form of a long vine covered in long drooping black leaves. When a creature walks into the range of a monster kelp, it will do a very similar thing to what the worm grass does, just kind of extending its body towards their prey even if they're out of range. Interestingly, monster kelp relies on movement, which implies that they utilize vibrations in the nearby environment to sense their prey. When a monster kelp successfully lunges at and grabs its prey, it will drag them down into its den, which likely contains an underground stomach similar to what the pole plant has. Monster kelp can be found in most areas that have large amounts of water in them, usually found half or fully submerged. The water they're in also seems to define the color of their leaves, as they're red in every region but in shoreline, where they're green. Monster kelp are likely a version of pole plants that have evolved away from their ambush style and towards just aggressively going after any creature that walks too close. Though they do still retain that bit of frailty, responding to damage in the same way and requiring three spears instead of just two to take out. And... Holy shit, did I finish it? Did I finish the fucking script? Right, I, I, I still need to make the conclusion. Alrighty. That wraps up the flora and fauna in Rain World Downpour. Not quite as in-depth as the last video, but you'll have to excuse me. I kind of had to write 35 pages of wildlife analysis. Either way, give me your feedback on the comments or any theories you have. I don't know. Just tell me how wrong I am if I am wrong. Shoutouts to all the wonderful artists who put their hard work into making the assets for this video three fucking months ago. Sorry for the wait, guys, but hey, it's, it's out, and now you can stop bothering me in the comments about it. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.